What is LQAS? John has a problem. His new health program has been up and running for just a year, but he's not certain if conditions are improving. In five years' time, he may get the results of a regional health survey. But in five years, it'll be too late to find out if something's not working as it should be, and too late to do anything about it. When it comes, the regional survey won't tell him what's happening right here in this community, or any single community. And without that information, John can't ensure that the very worst areas are getting the attention they need. John's problem is not a new one. LQS was developed many years ago to help people like him solve similar problems. LQAS stands for Lot Quality Assurance Sampling, and it was first used by industry in the 1920s to control the quality of batch production in factories. It was adapted for use in health programs in the mid-1980s. LQAS is all about setting priorities. We don't need to know exactly how many people are affected by our program. We just need to know is the supervision area reaching its targets, or is it well below them? If you can answer these questions, then you can distribute your limited resources in the best possible way. LQAS is about getting the information you need right now, so you can act on it to improve your program in your area. You can collect the information yourself with your own local teams. LQAS has other benefits. You can put together all the information from the different supervision areas in your district, and this will give you a big enough sample to calculate precise average coverage for the district as a whole. LQAS provides you with a specific framework for running a survey, a set of rules, which if you follow them will help you keep track of your program. By the end of this series, you'll know how to divide up the community into sections, identify locations for your household interviews, carry out those interviews, and bring all of the results together in a form that you can use. These data will then help you allocate your resources in the best possible way and make a real change in the community. These films are designed to complement the LQAS training sessions. They are not a substitute for the full program of training, which takes at least four to five days, but they should help explain some of the key ideas behind an LQAS survey. You may find it easiest to watch just a few chapters at a time and really get to know the ideas, re-watching if necessary, until you're comfortable with the process. So, let's get started. What is random sampling? If we want to know the coverage in an area with a health service, we could just talk to everyone in the client group, mothers for example, and ask them if they received a particular health service. But this could be incredibly time-consuming and costly. This is called the census approach, and for regular monitoring, it's just not practical. Instead, we use a technique called random sampling. A wonderful thing about random sampling is that by taking just a few people and asking them questions, we can learn about the bigger picture, our overall coverage. The few can describe the whole. Now, let's see how this works. In this bag, there are 50 green marbles and 50 red marbles. In this other bag, there are 80 green marbles and 20 red marbles. Imagine that each of these bags represents all of the mothers with children 12 to 23 months of age in either Supervision Area A or Supervision Area B. The green marbles represent mothers whose child has been vaccinated against measles before their first birthday. The red marbles represent those who have not. Now we want to know the percentage of children that have been vaccinated in these two supervision areas. One way to get the answer would be to count all of the mothers of those children, 
that is, count all the green and red marbles in the bags. But we don't have the time or money for that. Instead, we can take a random sample of the women from each supervision area. You can take, say, 30 marbles from each bag and count them. Remember, green is good, red is bad. Around 50% of our first sample will be green. That is what we'd expect from the bag with 50 red and 50 green marbles. From the other bag, supervision area B, our sample of 30 shows 23 green marbles, or close to 80% green. Again, this is what we'd expect with 80 out of 100 marbles in the bag being green. We've basically the same result without having to count all the marbles. The few represents the whole. And to check, we can count all the marbles from each bag just to make sure. For this to work, it's important that the sample is random. If I'm a data collector and I just visit houses that are close to the road, for example, because it's easier for me, I might be ignoring all of those other people who aren't getting the right medical attention, and I would never know. That's why we make sure that every house on this map has an equal chance of getting picked. And this will give us a much better idea of the real spread. How does LQAS work? When you're monitoring your health programs, you have to be confident you know which areas are meeting their targets and which are falling well behind. For LQAS, we use the same random sampling technique, but instead of taking a sample of 30, we're going to take the smallest possible sample that we need to give us the information we need. 19 is a commonly used sample size for LQAS. A sample this small won't give us an exact figure for the coverage in a single supervision area. But that isn't our priority. Instead, we need to know is a particular supervision area meeting its targets or falling well behind? Or alternatively, is it above average for the region or well below the average? In other words, this sample of 19 allows us to classify a supervision area as a success story or as a source of concern. To do this, we use a specially designed LQAS table, which gives us cutoff points or decision rules, and these tell us into which category our supervision area falls using the results from our sample of 19. We'll look at this in more detail later on. How do I identify my supervision areas? The first step is to look at the district, or NGO catchment area, to be surveyed and break it down into several supervision areas. At least five supervision areas is ideal, but certainly no less than three, or there just won't be enough data to calculate a precise average coverage for the district as a whole. Supervision areas should be defined according to practical constraints, geographical features, or altitude, or by looking at how health services are already being delivered. Supervision areas are very similar to factories as used in the 1920s. They are production units for health. Supervision areas can represent the areas for which different teams of health workers are responsible. These can be vaccination squads, health center catchment areas, or even political administrative areas like a subdistrict or a county. Whatever makes sense for your district and makes it easier to make changes to the health system. This subdivision is usually done by supervisors at the district level. Where should I go to conduct the interview? The next step in the survey is to identify locations for the 19 interviews in your supervision area. We can make this decision using a few steps. You'll find two useful tables in your participants manual. 
In the first table, list all the different communities in your supervision area and list their populations. If there is no population data available, you can use the number of houses or the number of births in each community, or just estimate the relative size of the different communities. It is actually the relative population size which is important. As we have population data available, we'll use that here. In the third column, calculate the cumulative population. You do this by adding the population of each community to the sum total of all the other communities before it, so you get a running total of the population. Next, divide the total population of the supervision area by 19, or the sample size. This gives you your sampling interval. This is the number of people you skip after you select one of the random locations before selecting the next location. Now choose a random number between one and the whole number part of the sampling interval using a random number table. The sampling interval has four digits, so we'll use the first four digits in the random number table. So if the interval is 1,236, you choose a random number between 1 and 1,236. Then in the second table, enter that number as your starting point. This is the location of your first interview. Then add your sampling interval, including the decimal, to the random starting point. This will give you the next location. And again, and so on. We need to find which locations each of these numbers falls into. For example, 622 is greater than 548, but does not exceed 1,278. So, the 622nd person is located in Santai. This will give you 19 interview locations at regular intervals. It will tell us which communities to visit and how many interviews to conduct in each one. Larger communities may give us more than one interview location. Once this is done, you can make a travel plan for visiting the different communities. You can visit the different locations in any order. Frequently, after the sample, you find that you have 19 different villages to visit. So it's wise to select villages which are close together and visit at least two villages per day to carry out the interviews. Select a team of two interviewers for each supervision area. Each one can go to half the villages. Select one supervisor who can manage the data collection in the supervision area. All the data should be collected in about five days. How do I select a household to interview? We need to pick a random household for each location in your sample. There are three different scenarios that you may face. If you have access to a complete housing list and it's accurate, use it to pick a house randomly. Then your work is done. But be skeptical of such lists. In practice, they are rarely accurate. If no accurate list exists and there are around 20 or fewer households in a community, draw a map with the help of a local person, such as a village chief. Assign numbers to the households and pick one at random. You can use a random number table for this. Select the number randomly by letting a pencil in your hand drop onto the table. Just use only the number of digits that you need. In this case, it might be two digits, up to 20. So just take the first two digits of the number you pick out of the table. If it's not a number you can use, just move on down the list until you find a number that you can use. Select this as your reference house. Then visit the next nearest house to conduct your interview. This ensures that any house not on the map also has a chance of being picked for interview. And the third scenario? 
If there are more than 20 households in a community and you don't have an accurate list, talk to a local resident. Often a community leader or village chief will help you if you let the community know in advance that you are coming. Use a large sheet of paper from a flip chart or the back of the questionnaire. Ask them to locate the center of the community. This might be a plaza, marketplace, or a church, for example. If there is no obvious center, try to pick somewhere in the middle of the community. The chief will know where that is. Add local landmarks to the map. This might include churches, mosques, schools, shops, or football pitches. Also add roads, footpaths, rivers, and streams. Divide the community into around two to five or even more sections using roads or local landmarks for convenience. Each section should have more or less the same number of households. Number the sections. Select one at random using a random number table. Add more detail to the chosen section like roads and pathways. If it's still very large, then divide it again into two to five or more subsections with about the same number of households in each. And number the subsections. Then select one of those at random using a random number table. Continue the same process until there are few enough houses that you can count them comfortably. I like to use around 10 to 15. Assign numbers to the houses and pick one at random. This is your reference house. Then go to the next nearest house. That's where you go to conduct your interview. This kind of sampling is called segmentation sampling. If you need to complete more than one set of questionnaires in a single community, you'll need to go right back to the beginning of this section for each set. Each of the 19 interview locations should be selected randomly using this process. Always update the map and keep it for future reference. You can use the same technique, segmentation sampling, in densely populated urban areas. Some urban areas can contain hundreds of households, but with the help of a local leader or chief, you will still be able to divide the community, firstly into large sections of about the same size. You then select one of the sections randomly. You continue the process just as we did in the rural area until you come to a subsection that is of manageable size. Then you select a household at random just as before. The definition of a household is a group of persons who share the same kitchen or hearth or who eat from the same cooking pot. How do I find the right respondent? Whenever you interview people, there are several ethical issues to consider. We won't be going into that in this film, other than to emphasize that everyone you interview needs to have given their consent to be interviewed. And they must feel totally relaxed and free to choose not to participate. Always read the consent form at the start of the questionnaire and before you start the interview. This lays out to everyone very clearly that participation is voluntary. You should then make sure that they are happy to continue. So first we need to identify the type of respondent we are looking for. This might be, for example, mothers with children 12 to 23 months of age. These are the people we want to interview. If someone who fits that description is present in the household you visit and they give their consent, you can interview them. If there's more than one person there that matches the description, you must choose one randomly by flipping a coin or assigning numbers and choosing one with a random number table. If there is no one in the household who qualifies, or there is, but they are absent and more than 30 minutes away, move on to the next nearest house instead. And continue this process until you find someone that you can interview. If two houses are equally close, 
choose the one with the closest front door. If the right type of respondent lives in the household, but is absent and less than 30 minutes away, we need to go and try to find them with the help of a guide from the community. If it takes longer than 30 minutes to find them, go back to their front door and choose the next nearest household instead. Using the next nearest house rule may take you into another community, village or town, but you must never cross into another supervision area. It is important to remember, if there are two or more interviews to be carried out in the same community of the same client group, you must repeat the whole process from the beginning with a list of households or a community map so that they are selected at random from the whole community. What is parallel sampling? If your survey is designed to assess several different interventions, you may have different questionnaires for different groups of people. Say you want to increase the percentage of pregnant women who make at least one antenatal care visit, improve newborn care, increase vaccination coverage, improve mother's skills in preparing oral rehydration solution, improve the treatment of children with diarrhea, and increase the percentage of women who use a family planning method. You will need several different groups of respondents to make these assessments. Can you work out how many you would need? Pause the video and take a few minutes to figure it out. Okay, so we need five different groups of respondents. Mothers of children aged 0 to 11 months to assess the first two interventions. Mothers of children aged 12 to 23 months to assess vaccination coverage. Mothers of children 0 to 23 months or 0 to 59 months of age to assess their competency in preparing oral rehydration solution. Mothers of children 0 to 23 months or 0 to 59 months who had diarrhea in the last two weeks to assess whether they were rehydrated properly. And women 15 to 49 years of age who are married or living with a partner and who are not pregnant to assess acceptance of family planning methods. So that's five different questionnaires. When you go to visit a household with your five different questionnaires, you'll want to look for anyone who matches the description you are looking for. If there is more than one person you could interview in a household, then choose one at random, using a random number table, or flip a coin. When you finish with that interview, you can move on to the next nearest house and see if there's anyone there who matches the description for another questionnaire in your set. You continue this process until all of the questionnaires have been completed. In this case, the five that we identified earlier. As we've said before, one thing we prefer you not to do is to interview more than one woman from the same household. This is because mothers who live together are likely to treat their children in the same way, and this can distort the results. The other equally important reason is that women are very busy, especially if they have children. While people are typically happy to help, if you outstay your welcome, they could respond inaccurately just as a means to get you out of the house. For the same reasons, we prefer you not to interview one woman for more than one of the questionnaires. If a woman fits the description for more than one of the questionnaires, then select randomly which one of those questionnaires you should use. There is an exception to this rule. If there is a child in the household who has had diarrhea in the last two weeks, then it is important that we collect this information. The number of children with diarrhea is relatively small compared to the total population of children, so it's a good idea to sample these cases as you find them. 
The same applies when there is a child with suspected malaria or suspected pneumonia. In any of these cases, a mother who has already been interviewed for one questionnaire can also be interviewed for a second questionnaire concerning, for example, diarrhea. Or a second mother can be interviewed. However, we must never interview more than once for the same condition in a single household. As we said before, two mothers who live together are likely to treat their child in the same way, and this can distort the results. Using the parallel sampling method, you can collect the data for all of the five questionnaires in your set with a single visit to the community and by selecting just one random starting point. But remember, if the community has been identified as a location for more than one set of LQAS questionnaires, then once you finish the first set of questionnaires, you must start all over again to identify the next random location, as we discussed earlier. What is the correct interview etiquette? Here is a checklist of things to remember in an interview situation. Dress appropriately. Smart but practical. Take precautions for rain, hot weather, or difficult terrain. Be punctual if you've made appointments. Do not enter the house unless you are invited. If you remain outside, do not ask for a chair. Unless you are offered one, sit on the porch or on the steps in front of the house if there are any. Tell people how long the questionnaire will take. Present any official document or certificate from your organization or project if this is necessary. Read to them the informed consent speech and then ask them if they wish to participate. Do not accept lunch or food unless it would be rude to refuse. Do not give gifts to interviewees. Do not engage in small talk. Mothers are busy people. Thank interviewees at the end of the interview. There may be other important points of etiquette which are specific to the area you're working in. A local guide can help you with this if you're not sure. What are the best interview techniques? In this section, we'll be looking at some of the things you should and shouldn't do during an interview. If you can follow some simple rules, you'll get better quality data. It's important not to influence people in any way. Otherwise, they might give answers they think you want to hear. It's also important to have data which have been gathered in a consistent way. And these rules will help with that. First, introduce yourself, your organization, and explain the purpose of the survey. Show your official document or certificate if necessary. Maintain confidentiality. Do not interview the respondent in the presence of others, especially for questions concerning reproductive health, which are highly personal and typically require strict confidentiality. However, for questions about a child's health, a mother may wish to have someone with her. Ask the questions exactly as they are written, or with any minor changes that were agreed upon during the training. Wait for a response, be silent, then probe if necessary. Use neutral probes like, anything more? If the respondent doesn't understand, ask the question again. Avoid making changes in the wording. Do not suggest by tone of voice, facial expression, or body language the answer you want. Do not ask leading questions. These are questions that signal the correct answer or that suggest the answer you would like. Try not to react to answers in such a way as to show your approval or disapproval. Try to stay completely neutral. 
If one answer is inconsistent with another, try to clear up the confusion. Try to maintain a conversational tone of voice. Don't make the interview seem like an interrogation. Know the local words for sensitive and delicate topics. You can practice interviewing in groups. Try to give feedback on each other's interviews and go through this list of rules again to keep a level of consistency running through all the interviews. How should I prepare for the interview? Here's a preparation checklist. This will help make sure you're ready to go into the field. Review the questionnaire and become familiar with it so you are not learning as you go. Do not begin the survey until you know your questionnaire very well. Number the questionnaires 1 to 19, assuming that is your sample size. Make sure there are the correct number of pages and that they are securely stapled. Secure any necessary permissions from local leaders and prepare local guides if needed. One of the benefits of LQAS is that we normally train local people who know the area, so guides are seldom needed. Make a checklist of materials. This will include 19 copies of each questionnaire, assuming that is your sample size, with two extra spare copies. Pencils, pencil sharpener, eraser, mini stapler, clipboard, random number tables, the list of rules for selecting respondents in a household, community maps, and paper for making new maps, a coin to flip, and questionnaire-specific material like literacy tests or ORS packets, official documents from the organization or project if these are necessary to identify yourself, a raincoat if it is the rainy season, and a bag to carry all of this. And don't forget your lunch and a water bottle. Now you're ready to go into the field and conduct your interviews. How do I complete the questionnaire? When it comes to completing the questionnaire itself, there are a few useful things to keep in mind. Once you've filled in all the information on where you are and who you're interviewing, there is a table to keep track of what's happened so far in the households you visited. For example, if the first household you visited has a respondent who is available for interview, you can tick the first box. But they might be absent or refuse to be interviewed. Or there might not be an appropriate respondent in that household. In any of these cases, you would tick the appropriate box until you reach a household where you can interview someone. This just helps you keep track of where you've been, or it's useful to know what problems you might have come across in locating a person to interview. This information is also useful for the later data analysis. When it comes to the interview itself, only read out the questions as they are written, never the answers or desired responses that are given there. Some questions will require you to circle just one, or a number of responses. This is instructed in the questionnaire. Make sure you follow the instructions carefully as you work through the questionnaire. Pay attention to the column on the far right of this page. This is called the skip column. Depending on the answer given by the respondent, the skip column will tell you if you need to skip ahead and which question to go to. Make sure you've read through the questionnaire beforehand so that you're comfortable with all the different types of questions you'll be asking. What do I do with the information I've collected? How do I complete the tabulation table? Why is it important to tabulate? Tabulation allows us to bring together all the information we've collected during the survey so that it can be analyzed. This information is called data. With all the data in one place, this helps us 
to make program decisions to identify priorities by supervision area or by program intervention within the supervision area and to assign our resources in the best possible way. Before you begin tabulation, check that you have the right number of completed questionnaires, that they are in the correct order numbered 1 to 19, if that is your sample size, and have the correct number of pages. Check that the tabulation table you are using matches the questionnaires that you have. Now, fill in the blank field at the top of the tabulation table. Work in groups of three, using the tabulation quality checklist as you go. You'll find the checklist in your participants manual. The system we'll use here is called the Caller, Recorder, Verifier system. First, the recorder reads out the question and the answer we're looking for from the left-hand side of the tabulation sheet. The caller then looks at the answer given in the questionnaire and decides which category the answer falls under. The recorder then enters the appropriate response code on the tabulation sheet. One for correct, zero for incorrect, X for a missing answer, and S for a skipped answer. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment. Finally, the verifier checks that the correct code was used, 1, 0, X, or S, and that it was marked down correctly. Be careful to check for any errors, like an answer recorded in the wrong column, which is easy to do when you get tired and concentration fades. This is why it's so important to always use three people working together, even if this seems excessive at first. The three people can swap roles regularly to keep things interesting. Let's stop and take a closer look at this system of coding. A correct response, or one, means that the respondent has demonstrated the correct knowledge or practice their answer will more or less match the desired response that's written in the left-hand portion of the tabulation table. A zero or incorrect response means that they did not demonstrate this knowledge or practice. This may affect some of the questions which come after it. Depending on the answer given, the respondent may not be able to answer more detailed questions. In this case, all these responses should automatically be recorded as incorrect or zero. The tabulation table will instruct you when to do this. X means a missing response, either because no answer is recorded or the response was recorded in a confusing way with more than one answer when there should be only one, for example. An X response should be removed from the denominator later on. S means an intentionally skipped response. This coding is not used very often, but occasionally the tabulation table will ask you to record a response with an S coding. This means that these questions were not relevant for that respondent, and these should be removed from the denominator later on. A skipped response should not be confused with the skip column in the questionnaire, which is just a way of telling you which question to go to next when you're conducting the interview. In some circumstances, an alternative form of coding may be used. This is fine as long as you are consistent. After filling in all the responses in the tabulation table, enter the total number of correct answers in the appropriate column. We can just add all the ones together. Then enter the total sample size, adding the number of boxes that have ones and zeros together. Double check any questions where the sample size is less than it should be, usually 19, and confirm the reason. If there are a lot of missing or skipped responses, then more information may have to be collected. Please note, 
We recommend that you complete all the questions in one questionnaire at once before moving on to the next questionnaire. Allow around 20 to 30 minutes to complete a single tabulation table. How do I use the summary table? To complete the summary table, you need to know what type of survey you are conducting. There are two main types of survey, a baseline survey and regular monitoring. A baseline survey is the first time a survey has been run for that program in that region. It's used to measure the existing knowledge or quality of care in the region and allows us to set realistic targets for the future. Regular monitoring is run exactly the same way, but it means that when you come to analyze the results, you'll have an earlier result, a baseline, to measure against. In a baseline survey, you will only be able to measure each supervision area's performance against the average performance across the region. During regular monitoring, you can also check if a supervision area is meeting its targets or falling well behind. Whichever type of survey you have run, the process is very similar. We'll talk through any important differences as we go. So, now we're going to look at the summary tabulation sheet. Gather the individual tabulation tables and organize them by supervision area. For each supervision area, transfer the total correct and total sample size to the summary sheet. Add the total correct for all the supervision areas together and record this in the total correct in program column. Do the same for the total sample size in program by adding together the total sample sizes for all the supervision areas. Then divide the total correct in program by the total sample size in program and multiply by 100 to find the average coverage as a percentage and complete that column. Be aware that the average coverage is more accurate when calculated from at least five supervision areas. It should not be used if there are fewer than three supervision areas. How do I find out how each supervision area is performing? For both a baseline survey and regular monitoring, we can classify the supervision areas having at least average coverage or being well below the average for the region. Using the LQAS table, find the average coverage among the percentage columns at the top. Always round up to the nearest 5%. Place your finger on this number. Now, find the sample size for your supervision area in the far left column. This is usually 19, but if for some reason the sample size is smaller for a particular indicator, then you should use this number instead. Place another finger on your sample size. Bring the first finger down the page and the other across until they meet. The number you land on is the decision rule. In the summary tabulation sheet, record the decision rule for each supervision area and each question below the split line, under the total correct for that supervision area. For regular monitoring, this box will be divided in two. Use the left-hand side to record the decision rule for average coverage. During regular monitoring, you'll have a target coverage figure. You can repeat this whole process using the target coverage percentage instead of the average coverage at the top of the table. When you finished, add this new decision rule to the right-hand side of the split cell next to the average coverage decision rule. 
Finally, circle the indicators for any supervision areas which are below the decision rule for average coverage. These are indicators which are well below the average and will require special attention. Then mark all the indicators in each supervision area with an asterisk that have not reached the decision rule for the target coverage. These indicators and supervision areas are classified as falling well below the target, and so these will also be our priority areas. How do I analyze the results? Looking at the completed summary table, we can see which are our priority areas. Look for the circled figures. These particular indicators are falling well below the average. For regular monitoring, you can also look for those marked with an asterisk. These are the indicators which have not met the regular target. Figures which are both circled and marked with an asterisk will be our highest priority areas. Our next highest priority will be to look for those indicators which are either circled or marked with an asterisk. With the information from our table, we can see how different supervision areas are performing with different indicators. Perhaps there are supervision areas which are performing badly in a number of interventions, and we'll need to find out why. Perhaps there are interventions which are not working that well anywhere, and we need to re-examine the program. We can see where our program is on track and meeting its targets, or we can simply maintain the level of attention we're already giving, and which areas will need special attention. The next two chapters are designed for people who will be analyzing the data at the district or catchment area level. If this isn't relevant to you, you may want to skip ahead two chapters to the section titled, How Do I Report Back to Stakeholders? So next, we'll be looking at Weighted averages. What is a weighted average? Not all supervision areas will be the same size. So if you want to find a really accurate figure for coverage across the whole catchment area, you can't always just add all the coverage figures together and divide by the total, as we did in the table. If you're not able to calculate a weighted average for the catchment area, just make a note in your reports that you've used a crude average. But if there is a big difference in size between the supervision areas, it might be a good idea to calculate a weighted average. Let's look at how to do this. We're going to use what's called the direct adjustment method. You can use this table to lay out your calculation. First, list the names of the supervision areas on the left. Then, list the sample sizes used, in this case, 19 each time. Next, the total number of correct answers in each supervision area. Using these figures, we can calculate our mini percentage, or P. Divide the number correct in a supervision area by the sample size, and record the number here. Now list the total population figures for each supervision area if these figures are known. If not, these can be estimated or listed as relative population sizes. So the smallest population size might be 1, and one that's twice as big listed as 2, and so on. The relative size is more important than the actual population figure. Add all these population numbers together and mark this total at the bottom. In the next column, divide the population figure for each individual supervision area by the total population for the district and record the number here. In the final column, multiply this last figure, the weight, by our earlier P figure, or mini percentage. Finally, add all these figures together and you have the weighted average coverage for the district. 
This calculation of average coverage still won't be exactly precise. With any kind of sampling, we can never be 100% certain of a coverage figure. So we also need to calculate what's called a confidence interval. A 95% confidence interval means that we are 95% sure that the real answer, the true coverage, lies within a given range, say, plus or minus 10 percentage points. We can calculate what that interval is, and it's important to include this information alongside our weighted average coverage. So in this table, we again list the different supervision areas in our district. Then we take the weight figure for each supervision area, which we calculated in the previous table, and square it, or multiply it by itself. We record that in this column. Now we take our P figures, our mini percentages. Q simply means 1 minus P. So 1 minus P multiplied by P gives us the next figure in the table. The next column uses this little formula here. We multiply together the results from the last two columns and divide this total by n, the sample size. We've seen this is 19. The resulting numbers will be extremely small, so you'll need to use up to four decimal places. Add all these figures together and record the total at the bottom. Finally, we use this formula for calculating a confidence interval. 1.96, this is just the number we use to signify 95% confidence, multiplied by the square root of our total, in this case, 0 0.002. The answer here is plus or minus 0 0.088, rounded to three decimal places. Multiply this by 100, and we have a confidence interval of plus or minus 8.8%. So if coverage is measured at 47.8%, we can be 95% sure that the true coverage will fall within a range of plus or minus 8.8 .8 percentage points. This is a generally accepted level of accuracy. What are subsamples? Anytime there is a question which may only apply to a portion of the respondents, this is called a subsample. For example, if you're asking questions which apply to children who have had diarrhea in the last two weeks. Because this question won't apply to everyone, you probably won't have data from all 19 questionnaires for this question. If, say, only six people have responded to the question, then this sample is much too small to use the LQIS table for the supervision area. That number won't tell us anything useful about that supervision area. But it can still give us useful data when we combine the results from all the supervision areas to give us a bigger sample. This can then be used to make an LQIS classification with a larger sample size. So in this case, we have a combined sample of 26. Using the LQAS table, we can find a decision rule for our target coverage, say 80%. For this district, the decision rule will be 18. In other words, we're treating the whole catchment area as a single supervision area. Here, the total correct in program was 17. This is below the decision rule that we just found, 18. So this tells us that the catchment area as a whole is well below the target coverage for this indicator. This doesn't happen as often as you might think, because we usually use parallel sampling to gather data from different target groups, as you saw earlier. How do I report back to stakeholders? We can now begin to compile a report to highlight existing weaknesses and set new targets. Use the Monitoring Survey Report format, or 
baseline survey report format as a starting point and make changes to suit the nature of your project. You can find these in your participants manual. You can continue to improve your program by learning what is working well. This will help you to improve those areas where the program is not working as it should. Always revise your targets so you can continue to improve the quality of your work. So what have we learned? You should now have a pretty good idea of how LQS works. You've seen how to divide up a community into supervision areas and how to locate random interview locations within each area. We've looked at the best way to conduct an interview and what to do with the data when you're finished. Following these steps in exactly the right way will ensure that you have consistent data which can be put to use in managing your health program. But this is only just the beginning. Make sure you talk to your trainers and to other data collectors. Don't be afraid to ask questions if there are things that you don't quite understand. And practice in groups as often as possible. Then, when it's time to go out into the field, you'll be ready to gather quality data. Good luck.